has become a crusade. That little cup with that little golfer on top means so much. Pride, flag, country, and the game of golf. The Ryder Cup was a friendly competition until we lost. And once we lost, all of a sudden people stood up and said, well, we shouldn't be losing the Ryder Cup. We've owned that for years. It was a battle. We were going into battle. We were going to, you know, this is, the Ryder Cup meant something. Nothing in golf quite compares with the passion and partisanship of the Ryder Cup. We all have to remember that when we play in the Ryder Cup, the spectators always say, us or then. This is our ball. This is their ball. They're booing us. Don't you love it? Let's go kick their butt. And he's done it. You cannot describe it. I mean, we all play under an awful lot of pressure and what have you, but play those last few matches when you, the rest of the team needs you to do your thing, and it is wicked. This is 12 guys, and it's the elite. This is the story of how a hopelessly one-sided encounter was transformed into one of sport's most exciting events. And of a once great golfer whose mission to bring back the cup resurrected his career and transformed the competition forever. It's now the greatest golf event in the world. The Ryder Cup is a biennial golf tournament played between the elite professionals from America and Europe. They play not for money, but for national pride and an historic trophy. This trophy, conceived in friendship, is now one of the most fiercely contested in sport. Sir Samuel Ryder, an amateur enthusiast from Hertfordshire, donated the cup in 1927 to foster friendship between golfers from Britain and America. Despite having invented the game, Britain enjoyed just two pre-war victories. In giving this cup, I am naturally impartial. But of course, we over here are very pleased to have won. American domination was confirmed with a victory on British soil in 1937. A British triumph in 1957 was a rare cause for celebration. At the 12th green, Dyree sinks his last putt to beat Ed Fergal, seven up and six to play. Dye Reese and his merry men put an end to nearly a quarter of a century of defeat. Says Dye, it must be the greatest shot in the arm British golf has ever had. And then the 1960s ushered in the rise of the American superstars. Arnold Palmer secures the cup for America for the 13th time. American domination continued through the decade. This is the putt that sank us, the putt that made Great Britain feel small in Texas. Al Guyberger sinks it. No one who knew the form expected us to win. What hurt was the realization we're still the country cousins of golf after 40 years of Ryder Cups. If Britain is ever to come out of the Gulf Depression, it'll be through young men like Tony Jacklin. This was Jacklin's first Ryder Cup. He found himself up against Arnold Palmer. A woman at Houston said of Jacqueline, fancy putting a boy in with Palmer. Lady, we need boys like Jacqueline. Two years later, in 1969, the boy became a man when he won the British Open. There is the shortest shot that ever won a championship. And Jacqueline is the winner. Here's his ball for the crowd. Finest day for British golf since Henry Cotton beat the whole US Ryder Cup team at Carnoustie 32 years ago. He was really carrying not just his own pride, but he was carrying his country as well. I think it was very important for Tony that he was carrying the pride of not just himself, but that of Britain. A few weeks later, a plucky British team, heartened by having a major winner in their ranks, put up a brave fight at the 1969 Ryder Cup. The tournament came down to the final singles match, a showdown between the great Jack Nicklaus and Britain's new golfing sensation. Their match was going down to the final hole. And if ever he needed a putt to go in the hole, it's this one. And it is! It's in! It's in! Well, what a thing to do at a time like this. 
Jack had just stopped me. I was walking off the tee uh, and asked me whether or not I was nervous, and I said uh, I was petrified. And um, he said, well, I thought I'd ask, because if it's any consolation, I feel exactly the same way as you do. The nation's hopes were on Jacqueline's young shoulders. Both players had to make their putts. The pressure now appeared to be on Jacqueline, but in an act of great sportsmanship, Jack Nicklaus gave him the putt, and in doing so, halved the match. They halved the hole, they halved their match, and the two countries halved the Ryder Cup. And Jack gave it to him, and some of the team members that we had uh, were not... Uh, uh, not appreciative of that. I think Sam Snead, the American captain, was furious. Some of the players weren't very happy. And I cooled a couple of them down, uh, and I told them, I said, listen, there's still a sport. That epitomized what Ryder Cup is all about. Jack Nicholas giving Tony Jacklin his putt in the last green for a drawn match. In a less competitive world, players had time for friendship. I remember going there and never having dinner with one of my teammates or his wife. We always had dinner with Sammy Torrance or, or Barnsley and his wife. We went there to enjoy ourselves and to spend time with our comrades and to share stories and, and to drink a little vino and, and to have a little fun. In 1970, America was stunned when Tony Jacklin won the US Open. Oh, what a, what a climax. He was a tiger, he had the the, the fight, and, and he had the warrior in him, and it didn't, didn't matter where he played. And here in Chaska, Minnesota, among rolling farm country. And it didn't matter what the odds were. It didn't matter what others may have thought of Tony Jacklin. When the Ryder Cup was next fought in 1971, Jacklin was still in sparkling form. Will it reach? What, what a wonderful putt. But even Jacklin couldn't win the Ryder Cup single-handedly. Jesse Sneed beats our hero Tony Jacklin and makes sure that the Ryder Cup stays in America. Jacklin's success brought uh, virtually instant fame. Jacklin was in demand. And not just for his golf. If you can use some exotic boost, there's a bar in for Bombay. Come fly with me, let's fly, let's fly away. Jacqueline was one of the first British sportsmen to experience a superstar lifestyle. Down to Peru. In Lomland, there's a you know, I might say, look, Tony, you've got to go and fly to uh, Timbuktu this next weekend. I said, oh, God, you know. And he said, but you're getting so-and-so for it. And then you go, no, I can't refuse that, you know, so you go. It was when I won the two Opens that uh, things started to go wrong, there's no doubt. But because there was no game plan beyond that. It was not long before Jacqueline began to show signs of strain. The young star's golden era came to a crushing end at the 1972 British Open. Jacqueline seemed to have the beating of Lee Trevino until the American raised the stakes with an inspired chip shot. And he's done it, again. it shocked Tony so bad that he had a terrible putt, three, three and a half feet left of the hole, then he missed it. And he has this to win the Open, which he does. That disturbed uh, Jack, quite, uh, Jacqueline quite a bit. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, he was never the same again. He was never the same. It did hurt me, and it hurt my confidence a lot. But again, with the benefit of hindsight, you know, it was, it was a good... I was already jaded. His nerves started to go. You can wrap it up any way you like, but his nerves started to go on the pitching which I've never heard him admit to, but he little pitch shots over bunk. Ooh, you could see the old legs were going a bit like that. And then on the putting. And that starts to erode your confidence and you just disappear. Very simply, it was about the only thing I did that made me unhappy. Every time I went on the golf course, I put myself under this enormous pressure. America's Ryder Cup teams arriving in Britain in the 1970s felt no such pressure. They would sort of come in and sort of brandish their Rolex watches and they always had the best shoes and the best clubs and the best unlimited golf balls. It was a very different story for the British team. We had golf shoes issued that were, had, that were plastic, essentially. And halfway around, my soul 
uh, came off half, half off, and I was flapping. The stuff that we were wearing and that we got issued with was uh, basically anything anybody would give us. And uh, that was the bottom line. It became uncompetitive, I think, from 71 right through until 79 because the strength of America was so, was so strong. I mean, when you put in Jack Nicholas and Tom Weisskopf and Lee Trevino, Hale Owen, Billy Casper, I mean, this is a strong, strong st a nation of golfers. From Arnold Palmer, who was on the captain of my first team, he said, uh, simply, I know we're going to win. It doesn't matter with whom you're paired. Just go out and play, and let's not give them a point. By 1977, the British team was so weak, the very existence of the tournament was under threat. They chose to gamble on the hopelessly out of form Tony Jacklin. He actually was chosen by me, one of my picks, to play, and really didn't, didn't perform at all. He was complaining about everything. No, sir. Well, that's a tragedy. I wasn't on top of my game. I was trying, just I wasn't there. I wasn't clicking for whatever reason. And Tony Jacklin sadly dropped from the singles, reduced to the role of spectator. But the debut of a 20-year-old star did give the British public something to cheer. Well, Faldo with this. For the match, he gets it in, and what a marvellous three days this youngster's had. Winning three points out of three. However, American stars like Jack Nicklaus could afford to relax as lesser-known teammates such as Dave Stockton were still capable of overwhelming their British rivals. <laughs> well, no wonder. Signs of jubilation. Don't ask how, they say. Just ask how many. And the bottom line at Royal Lytham reads United States, 12 and a half, Britain and Ireland, Seven and a half. In the 70s, it virtually became a, a non-event, especially in America, because um, nobody was bothered about it. They had a job to sell tickets. I think probably a difficulty getting a venue even. So something had to be done. I believe people like Nicholas said, you know, if you really want to keep this a week in the, in the, the calendar, you know, we need a match. The last hope for the tournament appeared to be to broaden the British team to include continental stars such as the young Spaniard, Severiano Ballesteros. And we thought that we would be able to give him a better game if he went from Great Britain and Ireland to Europe. And um, sure enough, we came back with that in the bag. The days of British isolation were over. But the new era did not begin as planned, with Trevino and company easily seeing off the Europeans at the 1979 Ryder Cup. Two years later, disarray followed defeat when Ballesteros was dropped. Yes, it's right in the middle of the hole. Seve was having a bit of PR trouble at the time through managers, trying to get appearance fees organised and settled and the press leaked the stories and there was always a headline about Seve. And Seve was branded a bad boy. The upshot of that was they banned him. Now, I just thought, you know, this thing can't get any worse than this. This is a joke. I thought they were interesting to see the Europeans uh, uh, beat the Americans in the Ryder Cup, but it seems to me like uh, that's more political than anything else. And I did say to myself, I'm not going to play anymore in the Ryder Cup. And I'd had it with the Ryder Cup at that point. And, um, you know, I, I, I just resented the way everything had been handled. As the 1981 Ryder Cup bloomed, players such as Englishman Nick Faldo and Scotland's Sam Torrance were facing a daunting task. This year, the American team is generally rated their strongest ever, with nine players who've won in major titles. Only nine have won majors. I thought they'd sent their best team. No, seriously, obviously the Americans are very, very strong, but I have tremendous faith in this team. They won't let us down, you'll see. Well, 81 was World War III. I mean, they had the most unbelievable team. They were the world superstars. They were the best in the game at the time. And uh, we were just there to make up the numbers, really. We needed a change. In 1983, with morale at an all-time low, the PGA approached Tony Jacklin to take over the captaincy of the European team. Jacklin accepted the challenge, but only on his terms. 
Much is made of the fact that he reportedly said, when offered the job, I'll do it, but everything must be first class. I said, I want Concord, I want Kashmir, I want the best. I mean, this was unheard of. Unheard of. It was one thing to have the best gear, but Jacqueline also knew he needed to have the best players. Tony Jacqueline, when I was playing one of the tournaments in England, came up to me and say, well, he was named captain. He said, Sevi, I need to talk to you. And he was mad. If I was mad, God, he was angry. And, and he'd every right to be. Obviously, I say, well, what uh, they did to me was very bad. It was very unfair. It hurt my, my feelings and my, and my career for, for a little bit. I know all that. I kept saying, I know all that. I know. And I feel the same way if it's any consolation. But, you know, the circumstances are different now. We, we, we've got it. We've got carte blanche to, to, to get this thing right. I say, I think, uh, I think you're right. I think it's better if you play and uh, I'm going to be uh, part of the team and I will be very happy if I can help you and to win the Ryder Cup. In 1983, Tony Jacklin took a European team out to America where the US had never lost. Tony did a great job. You know, we flew Concord, made the big entrance, upgraded everything. All of a sudden, we had cashmere jackets and all this sort of thing. Make, again, the, the feel-good factor. Good. So he does. Well done, by Nick Faldo. But the American champions were ready for the challenge. The US team were as intimidating as ever. Meanwhile, in the European camp, Severiano Ballesteros felt uncomfortable at being paired with the team's rookie, Paul Way. Angel Gallardo come up to me and he said, I think you need to talk to Sevi. I said, what, well, is he not happy? He says, mm, yeah, you know. Perhaps the greatest player in the world today, and behind him, his young teammate, who said yesterday, I was really surprised when I was paired with Sevi today. It was quite an experience for him. You're not uh, too happy about, you know, being with him? He said, uh, his boys, I feel like his father, you know, I'm holding his hand every shot, I am there, I'm trying to play my thing. I said, but Sevi, that's why you're playing with him, you know, in here you are his father, you, you, you know, you've done it. And of course, in Paul's case, Paul was young enough, he was 21, he was still young enough to think he was actually going to be better than Sevi anyway, so he wasn't intimidated by playing with Sevi, and this combination was turning out to be good. And, you know, he stood and thought about what I said to him for a minute, and he says, for me, it's no problem. With Seve in full flow, the Europeans were matching America. All right, so what a great part of that man. And other European golfers were playing above themselves. Oh, boy. American captain Jack Nicklaus could only look on and hope. Pushed to the wire, Lanny Watkins had to deliver for the U.S. Probably the most nervous that I've ever been playing any one shot that I can remember in, in my career. And he's done it. Thank you, Calvin. <laughs> behind there, Curtis Strange. Is this team play or not? The U.S. had won by a single point. It was so, so close that last day. So, so close. I remember the prize giving uh, and uh, closing ceremony was, uh, you know, I'm a fairly emotional sort of guy anyway, but it was difficult to get through that. There's a picture somewhere I've seen subsequently that sort of says it all, the faces of our team. They were a grim looking bunch, you know, when we were all sitting there thinking, oh, you know, we lost by half a point after all that. Everybody uh, was very much down with the head and very sad because we lost. And I remember I was in front and I look back and I say, hey, guys, I say... In mortal words, when he came in, he says, you know, this is not a, a loss for us, this is a victory, which was unbelievable. We don't have to be so sad and with the head down. This is, this is the, the, the first time that we really have a good chance to beat the Americans. This is the beginning. Two years later, in 1985, the teams met again at the Belfry in England. 
Tony Jacklin was up against his old adversary. Well, and we have enjoyed them to the utmost. I hope that at the end of this week, Sunday evening, I'll be able to stand here and have just a bigger smile as I have right now. And I don't see any reason that I shouldn't have when I introduce these players that I have with me here. We had a situation there in 85 at the Belfry where Lee was made captain. And it was clear to me, you know, and you're looking for weakness again, you're, you, you know, the, the antennae are out, you, you're sort of looking for it. But Lee was treating it just as all the captains through the 70s are treated, in America, that is. You know, you two got a guy, you two got a guy. Go and kick butt, you know. I mean, and that's, that, that's all I had to say, you know. There was all this uh, supreme confidence, you know. It didn't matter who played with who. You know, you were going to stuff the oppo anyway. And it doesn't make any difference in, in, in the world about, uh, about personalities, and I can't play with this guy, and this guy can't play. At least, listen, you're playing for flag. You're playing for country. You're playing for your family. You're playing for your teammates. It doesn't make any difference who your partner is. You're still trying to play as best you can. But Tony Jacklin felt he had to do everything possible to improve his team's chances. I was living this thing. It wasn't just that week. It was uh, the two years up to it. I, I tried to be everywhere uh, the, at the end of every match. I tried to be on the first tee at the beginning of every match. He had this enthusiasm for, you know, we can do it. We can do it. We can beat him. You know, there was a strange rule Britannia, uh, uh, you know, about him. You know, he was so enthusiastic. It was a joke. We, used to, we had to sit him down on the sofa at night, give him a big whiskey. His voice had gone, he was hoarse. We'd sit there and say, right, Tony, now you can shut up. You're all right, you've done your day's work, have a rest. The British crowd had also set their hearts on victory. When I heard boos and hisses when the Americans were introduced, I was shocked. They announced me and they booed my name and, and O'Meara looked at me and started turning kind of white. And he, this was, I think, his first Ryder Cup. And, he said, well, what's all that? And I said, man, they're booing us. Don't you love it? Let's go kick their butt. And that stayed just on the right line. And what a putt the hole and what a moment to do it. And that's typical Lanny Watkins stuff. Despite Jacqueline's best efforts, his team were trailing. The American team felt like we were gonna win because we did have a lot of great players, we had a lot of stars. I felt that we all thought we were gonna win. And then Sunday, when we had the lead, and then all of a sudden on the back nine, it just started to melt. Turning point was the second day when Craig Stadler missed that 12-inch putt on 18. It looked like it just took the gas out of everyone. And it took everything out of, out of uh, uh, Craig Stadler. The match is therefore halved. And the overall match is all square at six points each. Meanwhile, the Europeans were beginning to enjoy themselves. Much more to the right. <laughs> so the Englishman makes another birdie. And we have a... On the final day, it was Europe who were in the ascendancy. And Ballesteros was lifting the crowd. <laughs> the whole match was coming down to Scotland's Sam Torrance. On the top level, fine second shot from Sam. And that's that. <laughs> There's an Englishman, a Scotsman in the way. From the crowd walking, walking from the middle of the fairway up to the green. I mean, the crowd noise was just incredible. It's a boy who dreamed, really, to win the opener, be the man who holds the winning part to win the Ryder Cup for Europe. Oh, right. <laughs> I'm crying since I came off the last tee. 
Incredible. 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 And they brought tears to the hardest of men. The British public's 28-year wait for the Ryder Cup was over. I was at the 57 Ryder Cup with my dad as a 13-year-old boy at Lindrick, and uh, it had been a long time for me too. For so many years, we've been beat. That time was it was kind of the revenge to see the Americans on one side and see the, their faces. That's the hardest thing in the world is to swallow, to lose, and then you have a flag draped over you. It really hurts. Jacqueline had settled an old score with Trevino. Jacqueline had been a captain before and, and was very successful. And Tony Jacqueline gave everything, almost took it personally. Where Trevino saw it as kind of a fun competition, but I think we all underestimated the ability of Tony Jacklin as a captain to motivate and rally his players into shape. Tony Jacklin's resurrection was complete. But for Trevino, the inquest was just beginning. Because they lost, the American team were very quick to condemn Trevino. He didn't do this, he didn't do that, he didn't spend any time with us, he didn't ingratiate himself, whatever. He, he, he probably felt he should have been in the team or would have liked to have been in the team. I actually got it from, from, from a few of the PGA members of the PGA. You understand what I'm saying? Some of the appointed elected officials from the PGA that I didn't do a good job. They had never played a Ryder Cup in their life. They wouldn't even have any idea what it is. They're the ones that stand in the background with the same t color ties and the same color jackets, you know? <laughs> didn't bother me one little bit. Uh, it, uh, I took it like a, like a man. They recruited the great Jack Nicholas after I lost. They went to Muirfield here in Dublin, Ohio. And they figured that I did such a poor job, they wanted to bring Nicholas back to bring the cup back home. I'm uh, proud to, to be the captain of this side who uh, is going to work real hard to try and bring the cup back here and uh, keep it uh, here in the United States. Jacqueline and Nicholas were head to head once more as Europe attempted to win the cup on American soil for the first time. From the outset, things went well for the Europeans. We were sneaking a match here and sneaking a match there. Yeah. Nicking one here and nicking one there. And before really they knew where we were, we were ahead. And Jack was sweating. On the final day, Jacqueline just needed his players to hold their nerve in the singles. Just roll it. Yes, that's a crucial point. Eamon Darcy's victory over Ben Crenshaw was the turning point. The cup was staying in Europe. Very disappointing. Uh, we thought we were going to win. We felt for Jack. You know, we felt like we let him down somewhat by not playing as well as we could have as a team. It was shattering that here, the greatest player the world has ever seen, Jack Nicholas, captaining it at this wondrous Muirfield village, and this team had come over and won. We'd beaten them for the first time on their home ground. For years. The Americans were the best players in the world from, from top to bottom. And along came the members of the Ryder Cup team in 81, 83, 85, 87, Langer, Ballesteros, Faldo, Torrance, James, on and on. These were great players. And they were going to challenge the American players, whether the American players liked it or not. To compound the Americans' misery, two years later at the Belfry in 1989, Europe retained the cup again. It completed an extraordinary hat-trick for Europe. I think it would be fair to say that in American sport, as indeed perhaps their perception of life, is based on winning. And they've had a lot of experience of winning. And until the mid-80s in the Ryder Cup competition, it was pretty exclusively uh, winning. And I think it uh, began to hurt them. In 1989, the man who had done so much to hurt America stood down as captain, passing on the responsibility to Bernard Gallagher. 
Tony was very successful and he won the Ryder Cup and so he gives me the Ryder Cup and he more or less says to me, there's the Ryder Cup, don't lose it. The team flew out to America in a confident mood, no longer the underdogs. But in the summer of 1991, in the aftermath of the Gulf War, America was high on patriotism. It was desperate to erase the painful memories of Ryder Cup defeat. A new course was specially built for the task. The Ryder Cup was a friendly competition until we lost. And once we lost, all of a sudden people stood up and said, well, we shouldn't be losing the Ryder Cup. We've owned that for years. Awaiting the European team was a new captain with a new determination. We're ready to bring the cup back. We, we've lost it. I mean, hey, guys, we've got to wake up. 91 was, was, was crazy. I think it had gotten out of hand in terms of us against them, whether you're looking, whether you are a European or an American. It was a battle. I mean, we were going into battle. We were going to, you know, this is, the Ryder Cup meant something. The week didn't start off like it was going to be a bad Ryder Cup. The week started off quite well. And then we have a gala dinner and where we show all the past Ryder Cup matches. And we all sat there and they said, are we going to show a past history film of the Ryder Cup? I thought, cool, this would be good. See a bit of, you know, the old boys playing. And we're sitting there, we're watching this. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, that's not, no, 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 no. And then suddenly Twig, the only person, the only European person we saw was Jack Nicklaus putting his arms around Tony, you know, that last green in 69. They didn't show one European player hit a shot. So we thought, well, that's nice. And, you know, some of our players, Seve especially, and Ken Schofield, their chief executive of the tour, was furious. A number of us, and I must confess to being one, were on the point of leaving that dinner because we felt that the, the Ryder Cup um, is about two teams. Bernard was too diplomatic. You know, Ken Schofield was seething. I think most of some of the, I think the, the, uh, the, old, the, old, the old school, we were seething as well. So, well, that's the, that's the way we want to play it. Really, we should have got up and walked out and said, fine, if it's going to be like that, let's have it like that. Over half a century of friendly rivalry was set aside. My players were actually being woken up during the night by a local station in Charleston given, uh, and saying this is called Wake the Enemy Call. That was their campaign. They, they would call, they got the room number, sure, and they call you at five in the morning. And we had to unplug. I mean, I was being called Paul Broadhurst got woken up I think at three or four in the morning and uh, th this because it was all wound up from the American team camp. And of course as the matches started suddenly we we've got them wearing battle fatigue outfits and hats and, and it was becoming unpleasant. I take full responsibility for that, because I'm a hunter. And when we were going through the things, obviously everything's red, white, and blue, and I'm going through the hat manufacturer, I said, well, make me some with, you know, we just finished Desert Storm, and there's a lot of pride in what America had accomplished and stuff. I said, make me some camouflage hats. That stuck with me for a while, uh, that that was really, uh, an unsportsmanlike thing to do, I guess, is the, is the bottom line of it all. You know, I wore the hat, Steve Pate wore the hat, and we just both thought they were really neat hats, and they were just fun to wear. Yeah! I was brought up, you always have to pick your own golf ball out of the hole unless you had a bad bat, so I shall, I shall be a rather partisan and hope that he gets a good stuff. There was a lot of friction between the teams and fans. The bottom line of the whole thing is that the Ryder Cup became very competitive and, and people's uh, dander got up and, and started to get very involved in the matches, uh, certainly from our side, more than we had been before, probably. So there was high tension, high emotion on both sides, going like this. By the end of the second day, Ballesteros had brought the Europeans level. And Saturday night rolled around and we were tied. At some point I woke up during the night and I realized, you know, there is a chance we could lose. And it was the first time that I'd absolutely even considered the fact that, you know, we're not going to win this thing. The next day, the most partisan match in Ryder Cup history was to turn into a duel between the German Bernhard Langer and Hale Irving. This literally was coming down to 
who was going to, to crack. Lange was behind and could not afford to lose any of the last three holes if Europe was to retain the cup. Owen was suddenly aware of the importance of his match. You know, after maybe uh, two or three holes left, you're starting to count faces and you see the whole team is there. And the whole European team is there. For Europe to survive, Lange had to make his putt. It's a good stroke. My exasperation not was that he was making putts, is that I was not getting myself in a position to close this match. I would kept leaving the door open and gave him opportunity. And he was a man who uh, was just marching right through there. It was coming down to the final hole on the final green. It was quite extraordinary because they'd won. And now suddenly they, oh, they may not win. And then it's down to Irwin. Irwin, one of the hard men, was like this. If there wasn't a nervous person within uh, a thousand yards of that golf course, I don't know who it was. Irwin for a three, and that's not in. Well, now. Irwin realized that Langer just had to make his final putt. And I could hardly watch, but in my mind, I'm, I'm saying to myself, he's made two of these in the last two holes. Can he make three in a row? Everybody was like this, not looking. I don't think more than two players actually watched the putt. Just deadly hush. It wasn't a sound. I think, I think the birds were watching as well. Oh, and it slipped by the edge. Langer had to feel like he was just on an island all by himself. America had the cup for the first time in almost a decade. But Europe, in triumph and despair, had reinvented the tournament and made it the most coveted trophy in golf. We didn't enjoy that night. It was uh, very sad. You gotta lose some, or else it'd become boring, wouldn't it? When we ended up winning, personally, I think they showed much greater class when we beat them than I think my team would have if we'd have been upset in our minds and we'd have lost. Well, the thing we thought was really wicked was we got a, um, we all got a Christmas card uh, with them in the in the ocean holding the Ryder Cup and with rejoice inside. That was nice. 